Good afternoon. Uh, this is a rather more difficult panel, I suppose, because it involves policy making and legislation, and uh, therefore requires some amount of legalese, etc. And a couple of our speakers wanted to have their PowerPoint presentations, and hence we brought the table back so that it's more for us. Before I start introducing the panel as we go along in order of who would speak, um, I just wanted to introduce a couple of notions so that I want to set the background for, the, for this panel before we all start talking. And Mr. Madhuka Sinha, who was supposed to be part of our panel, had to drop out due to a, a, another assignment that we had to take on uh, from the government. And Mr. Raghavendra, the Registrar of Copyrights, <coughs> cover some of the issues that we had expected you to touch upon. So, the way that we wanted to structure this panel was to bring the highlight in the context of the amendment of 2010, the bill of, uh, of 2010 of the copyright amendment, which uh, went into a standing committee report, uh, which we will discuss in, uh, in this panel. And so it is in that context uh, that we are talking about copyright issues in publishing today. A while ago, we had, uh, in my office, I got a call from uh, Peacher's uh, editor of a funky new magazine that's really caught everyone's attention in Delhi. And she called me to say, will you sell my book in your shop? And I said, uh, we are publishers. And she said, what publishers? I said, we publish illustrated books. And she said, oh, then will you carry it in your gallery? And I was a bit stumped because this was not coming from someone who was not even in an allied, I mean, not a lay person, so to say. So I was just, it set me thinking that how much do we really know about different segments in publishing, different kinds of publishing. And there are so many such gaps that exist and the understanding of book publishing and within books, the segments that exist, I find that there is a, a little bit of lack of understanding even amongst publishing professionals themselves. And it is in that context that I wanted to try and have some issues being brought out by our panel members. So I'd like to invite uh, Mr. Raghavendra, the Registrar of Copyrights uh, of India, to talk about the amendment and the previous amendments to the Copyright Bill that have taken place and also the international treaties under which our copyright regimes are now being shaped. So. Thank you, Anita. Good afternoon, everybody. I know it's very tough to manage the post-lunch session, but uh, I'll try myself to give some interesting information to you. I'll be speaking basically <coughs> on the copyright law, amendments, the five amendments, major amendments uh, happened uh, before and the latest amendment uh, which has become a talking uh, point every day. Uh, that is the copyright amendment bill 2010. We are all aware that we, are, we follow the Indian Copyright Act 1957 uh, which was introduced in 1957. Uh, before that we had a British uh, law, uh, Indian Copyright Act 1940 was replaced in 1957. After that, five times this 1957 act was amended. You know, the policy making in India is incremental and also iterative. And then uh, whenever we make policy, we consult invariably with the stakeholders. In the latest uh, amendment, we consulted uh, about more than 30 stakeholders. There was a uh, consultative group uh, consisting of 30 stakeholders. And then a drafting committee was constituted uh, uh, out of these 30 members. And this was the committee which uh, drafted this bill. Okay? And the first amendment took place in 1983. I'll be covering only issues pertaining to the authors and publishers. There are so many issues I'm not covering here because time is very uh, scary. 1983 basically conform with the Band Convention. You know, the Band Convention for the Literary and Artistic Works. The first international copyright convention which was <coughs> finalized in 1886 
uh, the initiative was taken by again authors, Victor Hugo uh, and uh, Alexander Dumas, Gaidin Mufasa, the famous French authors uh, who were members of uh, association of uh, International Association of Art, uh, Artistic and Literary Works. With the help of French Federation uh, and also the Swiss Federation, uh, they called the meeting of uh, some like-minded countries. They wanted an international organization of copyright laws because the publishers and the authors were being treated differently in different countries. The minimum rights were different uh, in different countries. They wanted to set up minimum rights, harmonization everywhere, minimum standards in the international copyright system. This bad convention happened. So India being a member of Ben Convention, again Ben Convention was also revised many times. Uh, and the uh, latest one is the Paris Act 1971. And uh, India harmonized with the Paris Act in 1971. And then uh, one of the major amendments in 1983 was ownership of copyright in public lectures. Because somebody gives a public lecture, uh, so uh, who will be the owner? because the person who takes initiative to organize that lecture will be the one. Whereas in exceptions to that, the collection of works is not a uh, fair daily. So the author again retains the publication of this collection of works, it says. And then ownership of, uh, and also a not only the copyright of term for the public sector organization was introduced in 1983. And assignment of copyright, the uh, first article, uh, first owner of copyright is always the author who assigns the rights to uh, publisher or anyone that has to be in writing. That is agreement or contract, whatever it may be. That was emphasized in 1983 amendment. Again, the <coughs> most important thing is compulsory license. The moment compulsory license is there, you say all publishers, you know, oh, what is this? You know, the compulsory licenses, the concept of compulsory licenses, something like exception to the right of translation, exclusive rights given to the authors, the right of translation in the Article 8 of the Ben Convention, Article 9 of the Convention, that is reproduction. So these are the rights given to the author, so exceptions were given to them. Of course, author gives it to the publisher, publisher becomes a right owner through by way of contract. Again, these exceptions are applied to the right owners as well. So why this was needed because uh, developing countries, they're basically the copyright importers. The developing countries copyright exporters. When uh, when convention uh, was, uh, you know, one by one articles were decided, the Sweden and uh, which led the Nordic countries said, uh, our language is different uh, because we need translation of English words, translation of French words in our languages. <coughs> So some exceptions to be given. So this developed slowly, but uh, the Bell Convention did not include these things. Whereas the rival convention called Universal Copyright Convention, which is administered by the UNESCO, uh, introduced these things for the developed countries. And India being the leader of the developing countries, in 1967 Stockholm Convention uh, pushed for this. Finally, a protocol was decided and uh, the exceptions like compulsory licenses were introduced for the translation and reproduction of literary and artistic works. Unfortunately, because of uh, misunderstanding among the developed nations, this was not implemented. But in 1971 Paris Act, this was introduced as an appendix. The Article 21 of the Ben Convention talks about special privileges given to the developing countries, and then it refers to the appendix, appendix one, uh, two, three to six. Finally, these things explain here. So, same thing was introduced here: the compulsory license for unpublished works, uh, that is uh, basically the orphan works when you don't know who is the author, uh, who is the publisher. Uh, somebody can go and file an application for compulsory license in copyright court, uh, get the permission to publish, uh, license to publish, obviously. Similarly, compulsory license was translation of, and, uh, of, of publications. So, these compulsory licenses are allowed with some conditions. If you look at this section 32, uh, the minimum time for the translation compulsory license is 
seven years of the, of, of the publication. The very first year, no one can get the translation right. But there are exceptions to these seven years again. If these translations are needed for the instructional purposes, that is education and research, then the time is reduced to three years. And if the language is not generally spoken, and then the time again really uh, reduced to one year. So the condition of seven, three, one year is given. And again, these publications are not for export, clearly says. So they're not for export, only for the uh, use in the, within the nation. But export is allowed when it is meant for only those language people staying abroad and uh, uh, the, the uh, association, the educational purposes, research purposes. Again, research is defined here. Research is not a commercial research. It is only the educational purposes. And, uh, uh, and and knowledge, non-commercial purposes only. And then uh, there are uh, compulsory licenses when uh, for reproduction uh, for other purposes. The Section 32A it talks about when the prices of the books are very high, especially the foreign books, uh, which are sold very high in India. So one can go for compulsory licenses, make them available at the normal price of that uh, book available in the market. So the publication can be done. Uh, if a print is, uh, a book is out of print, the public, uh, publisher is not willing to bring uh, the reprints of that, those books and circulate in the market. Our books uh, rates are very high, so these compulsory licenses are. But uh, if the same publisher decides one day to bring out publications and of these works, translations of these works, they automatically the license given to the other publisher uh, ends. But the books already printed that he can sell. So that those uh, already printed books won't be treated as infringed copies or pirated copies. And then this is these are the important things uh, related to publishing and authors, 83 amendments. And then 84 amendments basically uh, they, they are, uh, there's a smaller amendment. Uh, to the act, it talks about it defining the uh, what is the uh, you know, duplicating government, uh, and also it included the computer program and software as a literary work. If someone wants to resist, uh, registration is not mandatory. You all know that it is only voluntary. The moment somebody expresses his idea in material form, in fixed form, one gets copyright in that, and if somebody wants to. Uh, get more protection, one can file an application in the form 4 uh, with the triplicate of those copies. Uh, if that is published work, unpublished is the two copies in the registration. Uh, here, the computer software also registered here uh, as a copyrighted work because Article 2 of the Penn Convention treats software and computer program as a literary work. Similarly, the Penn Convention uh, Article 9. Para 2 clearly mentions computer programs are literary works. Why this is needed? Because and the, the TRIPS was negotiated in the WTO in 1995. The question came whether literary uh, works uh, includes computer program or not. Because some countries like US, Japan, they give patent protection to uh, computer programs. So uh, India and other, uh, many other countries, they said no. Okay, you have to be as a copyright program. So this flexibility was given in the uh, Article 27, which we follow. Because if you look at the Article 3K of the Patent Act 1970, clearly says what are not inventions means computer program per se, not an invention. So something is not an invention, you don't get paid. Next. Next. Uh, Next important amendment is uh, enhanced punishment for a second and a subsequent convention. So when pirated books are sold, if somebody is selling pirated books at the red light, uh, okay, somebody uh, and, and those books are caught, the person who has been caught, arrested and given, convicted and given punishment, uh, after he is continuing that a second time and subsequently, so increased punishment was in, in, in introduced uh, in 1984 amendment. That is. The new section was introduced, uh, section 63A. Then the police uh, sub-inspector was given enormous powers. So he 
he can arrest anyone if he is holding the pirated copies of literary artistic works or even sound recordings without any warrant he can go and seize those all those material so sub inspector was given those powers and then 92 amendment very very interesting for the books point of view you know term of copyright you all know pen convention fix the time of post mortem authors they call pma and that is life plus author if an author dies today uh, 17th of uh, september so first january from next year uh, the day is counted for the 50 years that's why the concept introduced in the pen convention so the, this is given in the article 7 paragraph 1 of the pen convention again if you look at the article 7 paragraph 4 of the pen convention it gives the member countries the flexibility to increase the term protection of their bill so it is not a mandatory that it should to stick to life as 50 so using that india increase the term protection for literary and artistic works life plus 50 to life plus 60 because uh, in 1992 the works of gurudev rabindranath tagore were entering public domain so lot of pressure from vishwa bharati and the politician across from the west bengal and the government to increase the term protection for 10 years at least so that was acceded to and government uh, amended the law in 92 to introduce uh, more uh, for the copyright and again after an expiry of 10 years one more request came that was not acceded and then latest request came from navajeevan trust which publishes mahatma gandhi's works they said bahu's works entering public domain in january 2010 please uh, make it for uh, allow us the perpetual copyright for mahatma gandhi works the reason why they wanted this because all big publishing houses standing outside even books are entering public domain they will publish and the uh, conditions set by babu will not be fulfilled by them so what are the conditions when babu assigned those works to navajeevan trust he put some conditions number 1 books will be published all these copyrighted books will be published for affordable prices you go to rajgarh Uh, at the center is one library, Mahatma Gandhi, Gary Finder to be knows, and you all can come back with a bag full of books. Because uh, uh, hardly 20 rupees, 30 rupees, 40 rupees. Even my experiments with with Gandhi and with Mahatma Gandhi, it's another Gandhi. So where does this money go? Babu said, 25 percent of these revenues should go for the development of Harijans, should be deposited in Harijan government. What the argument of Navajeevan Trust is, if the Babu works enter public domain, do you think that Penguin, Harper Collins, and everybody is going to publish books at the cheaper ones? But obviously, uh, you know, the quality of books will be higher. The paper, the print, the color, photograph, everything, superior quality, no doubt about that. And are they going to deposit 25% of those revenues? Then we said, look. You know there is a limit for the copyright internationally, perpetual rights not given in economic rights point of view, but moral rights different. That I will come later in the next uh, slide. So uh, that was not accidental. But uh, it is for their publishing houses to decide whether they would like to contribute in respect of Papua to 25 percent to Arjun government. So we are not going to force them. That was that. And then 92 another important thing happened. A bill was introduced in the parliament. That was called copyright assessment. What was the need? You all know that when I go to library, I pick up a book. I don't have a time to take down notes, so I photocopy few pages for my personal. It's not infringement, okay? I, uh, it is my personal use or my private use. I photocopy few pages. But how this photocopying is done? There is a villain called photocopy machine, okay? And also fax machine. So all these kind of machine. Are eating into the revenues of authors and publishers. So to compensate, that's why the three-step test test, uh, the uh, introduced in the 1967 Stockholm Convention, it says there are exceptions to the reproduction right. Uh, it talks about certain cases only exceptions should be given. It should not be in conflict with the commercial exploitation of the work, and it should not prejudice the interest of the author. 
So when we give this kind of private and personal uh, use rights to in the public interest, so there there is a prejudice to the interest of the author. Then there should be equitable remuneration. So that equitable remuneration to help the authors and right owners should be given in some way by the government. So introduce a cess on selling of these machines, which are relates to the interest, economic interest of the right owners, like publishers and authors, uh, was planned in '92, but there was uh, across the board opposition from all the political parties. So this is a draconian law, and all that. Uh, the bill was not passed; it died its own death. Okay. Next, 94 amendments. 94 amendments, major amendments. Basically, this was meant the law to come in only with the Rome Convention. Rome Convention is giving rights to uh, performers, broadcasting organizations, and also phonograph, that is, uh, producers of phonograph, <coughs> music companies. But one thing is important for the authors, literary works, and also the right owners, like publishers, is the compulsory <coughs> registration of copyright societies. So after that, only the IRRO was registered uh, as a copyright society for reprogramming rights. And then uh, the fair dealing was uh, uh, touched upon, a lot of uh, fair dealing thing was done, and also the moral rights. If you look at the uh, Article 6 bis, which was introduced in the uh, Rome Revision 1928 of the Bell Convention, uh, they try moral, this concept of French. French system is totally different. The author's rights are more important. I said, economic rights can be assignable. So economic rights, are, the moment author writes a book, he gets the right to reproduction, right to circulation, right to publication, right to adaptation, translation, all these rights, he will sell differently. We are aware about the section 18 and 19 of copyright act. You know, territoriality right is given in mode of assignment 19. So you can uh, give the assign that rights uh, territorially for uh, India or uh, abroad. Uh, if you are not mentioning that in your contract is India, you can give the time period. If you are not given the time period, it's deemed as a five-year period and all that. But uh, you get money for that. But the moral rights are not uh, assignable, they are inalienable rights. So there are two key moral rights out there: the right to paternity and right to attribution. The Premchand Godan, now Premchand Godan in public domain, still the Premchand name remains. He is the author. The author's name cannot be taken away. Even some author writes a book, even assigned all the rights to publisher, publisher cannot remove the rights and then keep his, put his own name as the author. So that is the right of attribution of author that cannot be assignable. Similarly, right to integrity or the right to respect, that is second moral right. It talks about uh, that no one can, even though after uh, economic rights are assigned, even after assignment, uh, it says the right to integrity, right to respect cannot be uh, played with means You cannot distort the chapters, you cannot mutilate, you cannot cut into pieces, remove from chapters. You know, you cannot play with the uh, what has been expressed by the author because he got the economic rights uh, uh, assignment. Okay. So this is about right to integrity. These things were amended, were made more strengthened in 1904 amendment. And then came 99 amendment was basically a smaller one because India became the member of WTO. Uh, uh, WTO uh, agreement was uh, is a multilateral agreement. It came as a bouquet. So one has to sign even trips agreement, trade related intellectual property rights agreement to be done. WTO agreement. But that, uh, the moment India signed, it has to uh, amend all the laws, patent, trademark, copyright law, to make it a formally the <coughs> trade agreement that was needed. This, this. So we introduced a kind of commercial rental right for the uh, uh, computer programs. This, this is the only literary association. Then came uh, the famous, most talked about the WIPO. Internet treaties, the World Copyright Treaty, the World Performance and Programmers Treaty. These are called uh, Internet Treaties of WIP. Why were these treaties needed? Uh, people talk about TRIPS Plus, these are not part of the TRIPS. But many people do not know that when TRIPS was finalized after uh, the uh, uh, agreements and all that, 
these issues develop. Digital uh, environment just expanded like anything in the 90s. Uh, they wanted to include this in the trips agreement. They said, you know, if you start including the new subjects, we need to discuss it among the countries. The article has been already finalized agreement. We cannot wait for another three, four years. So remove that and give the responsibility to WF people to decide that. And let us go ahead with the existing law. That's why the digital issues of the copyright was not included in the trips agreement. The finally, WFPW took up that and then two internet treaties were negotiated and finalized. One for the literary artistic works and the second one for the phonograph and performance. The WCT extends the rights of authors in the internet and digital environment. That is very, very important. I'll just start I'd like to request you to speed up. Yeah, oh, okay. And uh, what are the uh, things introduced in the latest uh, amendment? One new definition was introduced, that is Section 2 as a rights management information. So introduced to meet the requirements of the article of the WCT and also WPT Article 19. And I'll come to what exactly the right management information is. Second is most uh, awaited topic in this conference hall, that is amendment to Section 2M, infringing copy. Section 2M defines what is an infringing copy. To that, a small proviso uh, was added in the bill. It says, provided that a copy of a work published in any country outside India with the permission of the author. So author gives his territorial right to publishing in India and then uh, publishing in London for the other otherwise. And imported from that country to India. So the book published in London gets imported to India. Shall not be deemed to be an infringing copy. At present, if you look at uh, the section 14A I small i2, uh, the author's right to issue copies of the work to the public. He has the right to issue copy of copies to the work in public, not being copies already in circulation. So what, what is this meant by oh, copies are not been uh, in circulation? It means for the purposes of this section, a copy which has been sold once shall be deemed to be a copy already in circulation. So books are sold in the bookshop, retailers. So exhaustion happens there. Copyright subsists in that book still, but not the right over that copy. Okay. So that right are the copy exhausted with that. So that copy, such sold copies abroad can be imported in India. So this is what exception is given because this exception is not allowed under 19 which is a territorial principle is there. So the exception to section 19 territorial principle is provided in the infringing copy. So what is the rationale behind this? So one of the reasons is, you know, we have so many low price editions uh, allowed in India uh, by the multinational uh, publishers and educational purposes. But the most of the complaints received with the government is these are all the old editions, not the latest editions. If the latest editions are available abroad, uh, if the prices are down, so those are allowed in India through the parallel import students, especially technical management, medical students will benefit. This is one of the reasons for this. And also, it introduced a kind of competition uh, in the rates, and then it's, uh, there will be a win win situation. And then there was a small study uh, conducted by whether it will be viable to introduce such kind of parallel reports in India. Uh, you know, in Asian countries like Japan, Singapore, Malaysia, Vietnam, long introduced this successfully implemented. And then Israel has implemented. And then uh, Latin American countries like Mexico, Argentina, Chile have implemented this. And then they have been running this successfully without any damage to the local publishing industry. Similarly, Australia planned to introduce a lot of fuel drive from the publisher. They conducted a study for the Australian Productivity Council. Study is available on the website. And they, all the recommendations are in favor of the uh, introduction of of the parallel import that is removing the restrictions on the uh, books 
make body look similarly. Yeah, yeah. And then New Zealand. New Zealand, I'll just make one sentence in here. New Zealand, uh, the beauty of the report is New Zealand interviews and they have studied how it worked over the last five years. The study report, uh, the empirical details say <coughs> that uh, industry flourished, but it didn't do any damage to either publishing industry or music industry or software industry or film industry. Everybody is flourishing. And then competitive prices are there, and then uh, it's a win win situation for the consumers and the industry. And then, uh, next the important um, uh, amendment, again uh, uh, important for the publishers, is uh, amendment to section 18. Here again, one proviso introduced. It says, protect authors, interests of the authors. Uh, uh, that it says that the future uh, mediums cannot be assigned. Now you have written a book, you assign it to the publisher. Publisher, you may be publishing in a physical book. If assignment includes the digital books, okay. But the new platforms, new formats, which may emerge after the date of assignment. An author does not know uh, even the publisher does not know what kind of medium, what kind of format will emerge after two or five years. So th that cannot be assigned. The medium which is not existing, the format which is not existing cannot be assigned. So uh, because many complaints came that even contracts are written not for the digital works, but uh, publishers are exploiting this, making digital copies and not giving royalties to the authors. Okay, and that came term of photography. You know, many people don't know the philosophy and history and rationale behind the uh, increase of the uh, photography works. You know, if you look at the section, uh, Article 7 of the Bell Convention again, it talks about the reduced term for the uh, photographs. Because photography is an artistic work. You look at the definition of it. All artistic works are life plus 60, but not the photographs. The famous, respected, renowned photographer, Raghu Roy. I grew up as a child looking at his photos in illustrated media of India. Unfortunately, that magazine is not in circulation nowadays. So beautiful photograph. That guy lost his case because in the digital medium, in internet, his copies, photos were exploited and you know, no moral rights, no copyright for that. So such incidents are happening. And then I you go to you, anybody read the history of Bell Convention, please. Anybody read the history of convention? Right from the 1928 Rome revision, photographers have been asking to remove this discrimination. And then this was accepted only in the WCT. The WCT gives an exception to the uh, Bell Convention Article 7. And then most of the countries, the 80s, eight countries have implemented it. India is the country. Uh, which is uh, implemented now. And then compulsory license for, which were given for only unpublished works, often works, we are extending it to the uh, published works also. Not only unpublished works, published works also. And then the following the spirit of the best appendix, we are saying not only the Indian works, even foreign works, you can get that compulsory license for the translation and the production, etc. And then Article 19 is related to the disputes uh, and the uh, copyright court. Uh, interim orders can be given. Recently, the High Court judgment uh, says the uh, copyright court can uh, give interim orders. And then this has been already included in the amendments. And then this is about compulsory licensing again. And then new provisions is about uh, digital publishing. You have been talking uh, ad nauseum since yesterday morning. <coughs> so, how to protect your digital books? Okay. You have to put encryption devices on that. There will be the, uh, the encrypting keys once somebody pays the money to buy the e-books. And that's, you know, technology always has to break and hack those keys and then illegally upload and, uh, you know, even remove the watermarkings or fingerprintings and keys and all that. So this has been uh, <coughs> introduced. Any unauthorized circumvention without the author's intervention you know, the right owner can claim the legal remedies for that. Similarly, right management information. So, the metadata related to the book, not only the author's name, publisher's name, year of publication, even the ISBN numbers can be uh, removed you know, using the digital techniques from the e-books. 
and then somebody can proclaim it, even change the tattoo and proclaim uh, that is a myself publishing form. That may be possible. So uh, again, uh, uh, remedies have uh, been given for such the removal of uh, right management information. And then the internet service liability. If somebody uploads without the uh, permission of the author or right owner, any book, uh, e book, available any website. Uh, so website owner has, owner has to remove that uh, within 20 days after receiving the notice from the uh, court or personally from the author and right owner. And then exceptions have been given because the you know, copyright law is balances the rights owner's interest and public interest. In a public interest point of view, uh, the Article 10 of the WCP, the World Copyright Agency, the exceptions provided in the Penn Convention are applicable even in the digital environment. That is looking into uh, that analogy and adopting that philosophy, we are very careful in protecting the public interest <coughs> for the research and the uh, educational purposes. The exceptions are given even for the digital copies. And uh, more important thing is, unfortunately, no one talked about the accessibility of visibly impaired, print disabled, and other uh, differently able people for the past two days. The first time we are introducing exceptions to the use of works by these communities. And then first we have introduced for only special formats, and then compulsory license for the profit. But uh, the standing committee has given recommendation to give more uh, facilities to these people, that uh, is being others in the amendments to the <coughs> copyright bill. And then copyright societies again here, the balance uh, is there. Only few uh, uh, publishers allowed in the R I IRRO copyright society, only few authors allowed, and there is no transparency. And he would say even the tariff scheme, uh, how much uh, the lady speaks for re receiving the royalties, how it should be distributed. So for the transparency, we introduce a scheme in the amendments, and again, uh, only authors should be the owners, we said, because being, being, being discriminated against standing up, they said, no, no, we should recognize the importance of owners also, because copyrights are assigned to the owners, like publishers, they should also be given entry to the copyright societies, that is also being uh, examined. And bottom others, when infringed copies of books are imported in India, so the power was given earlier to the provincial of copyrights, since, uh, for, 1958, no complaint uh, apparently received in the office. So, the, uh, this was transferred to the custom department now. So, by uh, facilitating uh, the, uh, stopping the importment, uh, importing the printed copies. And then, public libraries, library exceptions that when a book is uh, available in the market, they are not supposed to photocopy, but for the preserve preservation purposes, when the books are not uh, available in the market, they can make free copies of the existing books. Yes. Now, we are saying. The books can be digitized and the public preservation purposes, even though copyrights are suspended. And then uh, this proposal of infringing copies uh, that are already discussed. And now the last one, last slide, this one. Uh, I'm going back to the moral rights again. Uh, the moral rights given during the existing copyright term only in the section 57. But the Article 6 piece of Well Convention says. And you give at least during the uh, existence of the term it says. It at least is interpreted legally that minimum. So you can go beyond that. Considering that when it that is all introduced, perpetual rights of moral rights, that's what we have done by removing that uh, temporary moral rights. So, and then what are the advantages for the publishing uh, and the authors here? So extension of copyright protection from the physical books to the digital networks and any, we are using the term of any format, any work. So if, apart from digital, any format comes tomorrow. So if, if the author, right owner will get protection. And then liability of internet service providers in unauthorized materials are uploaded. And then uh, remedies, uh, the protection of digital books, but the digital right management, PPMs and RMIs. And, and the transparency in the copyright societies for the distribution of the collection of distribution of royalties and parallel imports a win win situation for the book publishers <coughs> and the others. And then no assignment in the future mediums to protect the rights of all. These are the important contributions. Thank you, sir. Thank you.
I think uh, this session we required to give Mr. Raghavinder this much time because it's there's no other shortcut to sort of end elaborating on the section. So thank you very much for making it uh, point twice for us. There are some things there that we take up for discussion later. Um, but a quick uh, sort of small tidbit before I ask Pranesh to start talking is uh, that in India, publishing has not received an industry status until, especially book publishing or any form of publishing, did not receive an industry status until the year 2008 when the National Industrial Classification was revised. Until then, it was uh, sort of bracketed with paper printing industry and it fell under the manufacturing industry status. And this has had an impact um, on the way that even banks look at credit for uh, book publishers or any publishers and they value unprinted paper much more than printed paper. So if you have unprinted paper, it's a little more valuable. So there's no cultural value really given to the printed form of the book. I just wanted to introduce that little information before I ask uh, Pranesh to speak. Today he's donning the hat of the policy analyst who will look at uh, copyright in a larger uh, uh, conceptual level. <coughs> Pranesh Prakash is program manager at the Center for Internet Society, which is a Bangalore-based non-profit research and policy advocacy organization. So Pranesh can ask you to fire away. But you have very little time. Okay, I'll, I'll try to keep my uh, comments brief. Uh, uh, the outline will be five main points. Uh, one, each of you is a criminal and should be jailed. Two, uh, that copyright is an actually a very ill fit for arts and literature. Uh, three, I'll, I'll uh, briefly outline some beef that I have with publishers. Uh, four, uh, I'll suggest some immediate alternatives. And, and five, going to some of the larger uh, change that we need to see as well. You have 10 minutes. Sure. So, each of you is a criminal, okay? uh, not, not just the people sitting next to you, each of you is a criminal. Every one of you, every single day, violates copyright law, whether you know it or not. And it's a, it's a criminal offense under the Copyright Act. So, uh, can you imagine a world where uh, forwarding a joke to a mailing list is illegal, whistling a tune is illegal, using the internet, doesn't matter what site, using the internet is illegal, search engines are illegal, uh, VCRs, thankfully I have a slightly older audience here uh, who know what VCRs are, VCRs are illegal, uh, reading aloud a book is, is illegal, especially recording it, converting a book for your blind friend uh, that your blind friend has bought uh, into braille is illegal. Uh, apart from this, lots of things that, that we have done when we were young and, and condemned when we were old, such as uh, photocopying uh, from books, listening to a friend's music cassette, etc., are all illegal. On a strict interpretation of copyright law, all of these are, including just using the internet, because at every stage, okay, copies are made. On your computer, on your browser, a cache copy is made, and and there and, and don't. Don't think that it's fanciful interpretation from from a anal copyright lawyer. Okay, courts in America in the 90s have accepted uh, uh, and have ruled against things such as RAM copies, copies being made in your random access memory temporarily, okay, as being copies for the purposes of, of the Copyright Act. Uh, they have accepted accepted things like page numbering being copyrightable. Okay, so it's, it's an insane world out there in, in terms of copyright right now. It's not uh, the, the way most of us, for instance, understood copyright to be. Uh, like in the fifth, like 50 years ago, copyright was a very different world. Now it's very different. Uh, don't have too much time. A quick thought experiment. Imagine an organization that buys a single copy of a work, distributes it to thousands of people, most of whom many of whom often don't pay, and even if they pay money to that organization, that money doesn't go to the authors. Okay, uh, would any publisher stand up for such an organization? This organization, they would say, is indulging in mass piracy, and the usual rhetoric that goes with mass piracy is that we are losing jobs, that government is losing tax, etc., etc. This organization exists 
as Jenny existed for, for more than more than a century in many places, it's called the public library. If we had copyright law that we have today, around 150 years ago, or even 100 years ago, public libraries as we know today would not exist. So just keep that thought in your mind. One large problem of, uh, with, uh, so have, sorry, how much more time do I have? So one large problem with, with uh, copyright law is that it tries to break together a large variety of very different kinds of creative activities and in, under one, one law. Okay, and people actually engage in these creative activities for very different reasons and try to make money out of it in very different ways. Uh, in, his, in, in a famous uh, interview with Playboy Nabokov, uh, quoted uh, Pushkin as having said uh, that he wrote for his own pleasure, but that he published for money. Okay. Now, not everyone shares that opinion of Pushkin's, or at least as, as Nabokov, because I've never been able to, to trace the original quote. In any case, Kiruba, for instance, doesn't agree. Uh, Frederick Nerona doesn't agree either. Many of the alternative publishers here are more motivated by the idea of social change and bringing out to, to light certain kinds of material don't quite agree. They don't write only for pleasure, they, they write for something else, they publish for something else. What about other kinds of creative activities? And what about new models of publishing that couldn't have existed earlier? So what about stuff like commons-based peer production? Now, copyright in no way fits what it's an activity like Wikipedia. You have to expressly craft ways around copyright and it's take immense trouble to have a site like Wikipedia up and running. Because the people who write it are very happy to give up copyright, but they have to go through through a tedious process of going through an agreement, etc. They can't just say, hey, take this work, it's 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 yours. Okay. Now what about performance art? How does that, these kinds of things, which are part of creative, they don't even get covered, right? Uh, now, the singer, the playback singer is a very important part of Hindi, Hindi film industry. Okay, and the playback singer gets no rights. So, it, there are all kinds of uh, things, right? Earlier, people were talking about new ideas or using multiple authors' interviews, which are transcribed and, and done copyright. Actually, one a famous case that we all study in, in law school involves precisely such a thing. When a person takes down notes, takes down and, and transcribes them, but adds their own bits, okay, who has copyright? The original person who gave the notes or the person who took it down? These kinds of things copyright does not even imagine existing. So it, it go, these kinds of things go to court. So uh, there are other kinds of divergences. For books, the author is the owner, first owner of copyright. Uh, generally, it ends up being the publisher. For film, on the other hand, you would think that, that the, uh, the authorial role uh, generally belongs to the director. But no, it's the producer who's the first owner of copyright. And so for songs, it's the producer who's the first owner of copyright. For music, written music, on the other hand, and, and for musical compositions, it's the musician. So there, it's, it's, it's strange, okay? And that's the point I, I wanted to uh, earlier, I'm sorry, um, which is that, um, which is that copyright in its present form is a historical accident, colonial, a trade issue imposed through WTO on us, and is not a single well thought out scheme. Okay, and uh, and the next point is that each area, uh, including within publishing, uh, is is very different. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna skip a little bit. Uh, I was gonna talk about uh, editors being part of the creative process and then not being part of the copyright system as, and, and, and stuff like that, but but yeah, let me just point out in, in publishing. Academic publishing is very different from academic journal publishing, which is very different from mainstream trade, mainstream trade publishing, which is very different from self-publishing, very different from alternative publishing. And, and which is very different from Wikipedia. Yet one system of law is there to govern all of this. Okay, uh, and in a recent article, as, a, as just a side note, uh, George Monbiot uh, in, in The Guardian painted uh, academic journal publishers as the worst kind of capitalist thumb because they don't even invest in their authors and yet they reap the benefits and, and the authors 
do it for free for them. Okay, and, and scholars write for them for free, yet, yet uh, they often can't read their own articles because if you're in a third world country, you can't afford 12,000 US dollars to have one year subscription for, for, a, for uh, some stuff, right? So my beef with, with book publishers, uh, both nationally and internationally, so uh, we've had opposition, for instance, in, in introducing uh, uh, internationally a treaty for uh, the visually impaired to allow to, to e, uh, make easier cross-border access between different countries. So what's happening now is that uh, in India, less than 1% of all printed matter is available for, for uh, persons with visual impairments. And we're all, we must remember, only temporarily able to. As we grow older, all of our eyesight are going to fail. We're going to need the same kind of technology and the same kind of access that people who are blind from birth or people who are uh, blind in, like in, in midlife have to face, right? And, um, and, and yeah, and, and the, who, when you go to WIPO, who opposes you? One, uh, the EU, two, the US, and three, publishers, okay? So all the rest of the world, okay, Asia is argued in favor of it, most Asian countries, uh, African countries, the, Latin, the, the Latin American and Caribbean countries, Everyone is in favor of this. The EU, with the except, uh, and, and the US are alone opposing this, along with book publishers. So that, that's really sad. Now, section 2M, I'm going to skip for a while now. We can uh, perhaps discuss that later. Uh, immediate alternatives exist in the form of, of uh, things like Creative Commons, which I don't think is a long-term solution. I think it's a short-term fix. So uh, Pratham Books, for instance, is a, is a great example of the kinds of things that, that can happen if you put stuff out under Creative Commons licenses. People will translate it for free for you, and it'll, and it'll work out. Some people will even send money your way without you asking them to. Uh, for instance, uh, with, with Cory Doctor, a famous uh, science, science fiction writer, uh, people like, uh, a school for, for blind converted has broken into Braille, and that's wonderful. And, and this kinds of stuff you can't do otherwise because it'll all be legal. People do it still. Most of the blind in India right now get their, uh, often get their education illegally. And they wouldn't have a place in the job market if they didn't. Okay? All of us, we have to remember, are currently copyright criminals. We do all those things which I mentioned earlier on a daily basis. Okay? Um, as far as uh, books are concerned, a longer term a change in law, I'll take it, uh, two more minutes. Uh, I hope publishers will, will see the sense in pushing for some uh, more fundamental change in, in copyright law. Saying, for instance, that uh, that digital uh, readers, okay, and, and that, uh, okay, let me start out somewhere else, right? That one, to get copyright, you have to have the intention to copyright. Because without that, right now, anyone who puts anything down on paper, whether they want to copyright it or not, uh, has copyright in it. This creates a problem with stuff like, for instance, Wikipedia, as I said earlier. Again, this creates other sorts of problems in which you don't know who the author of something is. And you can't republish it, you can't use it, you can't do anything with it. It's the or orphan works problem. And and uh, secondly, there are, there are insane terms for copyright. You know, if, if you look at copyright as something that provides an incentive to create, after you're dead, there's no incentive to create. You can't create after you're dead. Yet copyright term extends beyond your death. Okay? And, and you have one hit wonders. You have authors who produce a single book and live off the royalties of that for the rest of their lives. And that's actually a disservice for, for their fans. You'd want them to produce more books if, if, if uh, possible. You'd want them to, as society, carry out some other kinds of activities rather than just sitting at home. Right? And so this actually isn't provides you a disincentive of some sort. Okay? And and if you had a much shorter copyright term, as it originally was, say for say 15 years or 20 years, and economists have done studies into this, uh, most notably around the, the Eldred versus Ashcroft case in, in the uh, 90s in the US when, when the Mickey Mouse bill was getting passed to extend copyright further there. Okay, uh, and they've shown that shorter terms okay, are actually better, and that increasing terms, which is what we're seeing internationally, a 10 years increase in term for Rabindranath Tagore does no good for Rabindranath Tagore because he's even less published in those 10 years. 
only by one organization ends up being published by many and getting out to more people. Okay, and, and this and, and George Fernandez is if you look through the debates, the only one okay in the in the Rajasabha who actually raises this issue, saying how are you doing a service to Guruji by by extending term for ten more years? Uh, traditional knowledge and cultural expression should be protected from misappropriation. I'm not going to go uh, further into detail of that. Human rights, including the right to free speech, uh, must be protected, and they often aren't. And I'll go into examples uh, of this uh, later on if, if we go on to uh, talk to me separately. Essential knowledge, goods, and services must be exempt uh, from, from IP in some way, uh, include because, it, and, and this is not just limited to copyright, um, uh, but I had to put this. Um, digital readers need the same kind of rights that non that print readers have, okay? and they don't have that those kinds of rights. They don't own the books. It's a myth. You don't own the books. Okay, what, how else can Harper Collins tell a library to to uh, you know take a hike and, and say that after 26 copies of this have been issued, okay, uh, that you have to read uh, buy this again? Some other publisher can say after two copies because the book still belongs to the publisher. Okay, it's licensed out to you. And I think we have to look into that system and, and change and give digital readers the same kinds of rights that print readers have. And, and this is another problem. You can't have digital libraries without a change in the law. Because you can buy a book once and keep it in the library and give it out to other people. Okay, So you can shift a book physically, but you can't shift a file. Every thing that you do with a file is a copy. You never move a file from one folder to another on your desk, on, on your computer. You only copy it to one place and delete the old copy. And what does copyright law prohibit? Copying. Okay? It allows for moving of books. Okay? But on the digital world, you just can't move. And because of this fact, copyright law does not allow for digital libraries. And I think that's a great shame and that we have to look at a larger policy thing. And, and, I, and I'm excited with the way some European countries and, and uh, some places in, in uh, America, uh, such as the Birkin Center for Incident Society, are trying to bring about larger change and arguing for digital public library of America, uh, America etc. Brownie, I have to now ask you to stop. Okay, uh, let me just mention four more points without expanding them. Okay, because Karnan is waiting, okay. and we have only about 25 minutes left. Really, sorry? Sure. So, uh, education should include distance and digital education. DRMs are a myth. They don't help protect your digital content is already safe with copyright. Okay, just as your offline content is safe with copyright, digital content is also automatically copyrighted. Uh, we shouldn't uh, make everything a crime, okay, unless it's a large scale commercial piracy activity. We must respect due process and moral rights beyond term of the author. Uh, is, is uh, unconscionable because, uh, as you know, uh, for instance, uh, James Joyce's grandson okay, has a very different idea about what one can and cannot do with James Joyce's work than James Joyce himself. Okay, so uh, it, it's it's unconscionable if you ask me. Thanks. So I'm going to ask Colonel now to present uh, a different point of view because we've been discussing this entire, the copyright bill, amendment bill has been discussed very much from the point of view of uh, how it would affect English language publishers in India. Um, but I'd ask Karnan to look at it primarily from the point of view of a publisher of an Indian language. And uh, that's what Karnan is going to tell us today. Uh, Karnan is S.R. Sundaram who began his literary career as the editor of Gada Chivudu, the Tamil Literary Quarterly. He launched uh, his publishing house in 1995 and has since expanded to publish the minor text covering fiction, non-fiction, literary criticism, and social and political commentary. Thank you. 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 Also asks us not to read from a paper, but I'm, a, I'm a 
all right publish i can't hand from so my experience as a tamil publisher and the issues we face are so divergent from the problems of an independent english publisher it is hard for me to believe that we all exist in the same geographical space for example proposed amendments to the copyright law like 2m that has worked up the independent english publisher and created a debate in the english media or probably not of much concern to a tamil publisher i often dream of facing problems encountered by the independent english publishers in india problems like book piracy and parallel imports the day one of kalachodu's book is pirated i'll finally decide that we have arrived <laughs> Tamil is probably the only Indian language. There is also an international language. It is an official language in India, Sri Lanka, Singapore, Malaysia, and for the last three decades, of the huge immigration of Sri Lankan Tamils to to the especially the rest of the world. Uh, it's largely spoken in about fifty countries in the world, and in Paris, London, and Toronto, the population of Tamils is over one hundred thousand. and it is said that more tamils now live in toronto than in jaffna and it's a municipal language in toronto and tamil <laughs> tamil publishing also happens outside india from uh, malaysia uh, sri lanka uh, little bit in singapore and a small amount in the rest of uh, western countries in europe and america and uh, so since you know uh, tamil is an international language now we also dream of parallel imports because this would mean international tamil market expands many folds markets of for tamil books in sri lanka and malaysia and the west grow to such an extent that they buy territorial rights from the corporate holder here and publish them for the local markets there and we do the same for book publish tamil book publish outside india that would be a dream come true for us uh, because the scenario where two of the tenses is possible only when the international book market becomes a fully developed market i do not intend to trivialize or romanticize the problems of the independent english publishers but the point i want to make is that it is maybe better to face this problem in a developed market Then exist in a market where piracy and 2M or parallel ports are not possible. The market will sustain them. Now about the impact of subsidy and territorial rights in the publisher-author relationship. Typically, a Tamil writer is uh, thrilled if the publisher signs a contract, sends him accounts regularly, and pays him some royalty money. Tamil publishers are not known to easily part with royalty money. For the star writers, they dole out some cash on the occasion of Pongal, like bonus to encourage the writer. <laughs> royalty accounts are not given as a rule, but only under duress. I would like to narrate two stories to illustrate the author-publisher corporate relationship in Tamil publishing. Ten years ago, I met the family of a great Tamil writer who passed away a few decades ago. Uh, and his book sells even today quite well and they narrated the story to me that publisher comes once a year to the home and pays a paltry amount as royalty and then he pr- proceeds to complain so much about the lack of sales the book publishing business and how less the this writer's book is selling but the children the grandchildren there are nicknamed him high day on his last visit when he was about to leave the granddaughter very innocently she asked him How is your new house coming up? And he said, "Well, it's right now immediately." And said, "Two floors are complete, and third floor is under construction." A <laughs> uh, few years ago, an archaeologist came to meet me. He worked for multinational companies in Asia, Europe, and Africa. He has written a wonderful Tamil book on archaeology nearly a decade back. He wanted to know if I will republish the book, and I said, "It will be an honor." He then asked me if the rights rest with him or with the previous publisher. So I opened the imprint page and showed him that he has the rights. 
in the process of discussion with them, two things became clear to me. That one, this was the first time he was taking a look at the imprint page of the book. And two, that he has never received any royalty for this wonderful book from the you know, previous publisher. Couple of years ago, I want to contrast this with another experience. A few years ago, I published a Tamil translation of Baby Harder's A Life Less Ordinary. The autobiographical, autobiographical story of a housemaid who educated herself and wrote this book. Before we translated this book, it was already translated to a few Indian languages and some international languages. And Baby Halder herself had traveled around the world a bit, uh, reading, doing readings and you know, signing copies. So when I gave her the Tamil translation when she came to Madras for vacation, she immediately turned to the imprint page, read what she could, you know, the information there in English. And then she asked me several probing questions about number of copies I have printed and what kind of loyalty I would, she would get from the book. In my 15 years as a publisher, this was the first time an author quizzed me on the details of the imprint page. Awareness of the copyright does not come with education, but only with the exposure to the issues of copyright. As a rule, Tamil writers lack that exposure. There is enough material for a doctoral thesis on Tamil publisher author relationship in the last century, which will essence be a history of exploitation of the author. A senior writer once wrote, how can you cheat the Tamil writer by not paying royalty when he does not expect to be paid in the first instance? <laughs> <laughs> there are of course a few honorable exceptions to this one. When Bharat Chodha started in 1995, one of our first missions was that we will sign a contract with the authors and pay royalties regularly. This is hardly a revolutionary mission, but in Tamil context, it created a bus for us that became our USP with the authors. The bus happened because contracts and royalty are not the norm in the industry at that time, and to a large extent even now. Very few authors have moved away from us in all these years. We have actually undeclared policy of not approaching an author who is publishing with a fellow publisher in Tamil. But authors often approach us. One major reason for this is our policy of respecting copyrights. The money is not big, and for many writers who are not dependent on writing for a living, it may not mean much in financial terms. But the few thousand they earn through writing gives them enormous satisfaction. Many senior writers have called me after they receive a check for a small amount for as loyalty, and they said. Uh, they have told me that this is the first time they are making some money out of writing. And in that sense, it was a magical moment for them. Like I mentioned earlier, the address exists the theoretical possibility of territorial rights in Tamil, since it is published in several countries. But our contracts never mention territorial rights. To my knowledge, territorial rights sales has never happened. Total population of Tamil subdoors at all is estimated to be around 800 million. But sales of books are minuscule compared to this total population. For literary, fiction and non-fiction, if one edition of 1,200 copies gets sold in a year, it is considered a fairly good sales. There are multiple reasons for this. I will touch upon a few here. One, book culture is not very developed. Reading books outside your school curriculum is typically considered a waste of time. Two, complete domination of English in both material and psychological space. More and more children are educated in English. Speaking in English is considered the final proof of knowledge. Tamil school curriculum is very archaic and encourages the child to take the language. And third, the establishment is completely biased towards the classical Tamil and modern writing is largely ignored in school and college syllabus. After three millennium of poetry is right, <coughs> prose, which is probably century and a half old, is treated like an abstract. Subsidiary sales are also not very significant. Again, to my knowledge, no Tamil publisher has sold film rights. Our film producers are too smart to waste their money in buying rights. They have this unpaid army called assistant directors who are commissioned to read a lot of books. Very few Tamil films are made with scripts. The movie team sits together, the storyline, and then develops the movie scene by scene over discussions. As per the situation and the context, the assistant directors adapt their character from a novel or part of the storyline and insert this in the film script. It's all done so cleverly that even the author will not recognize this piracy. 
digital and e-book sales have, have not really yet taken off in a big way. And though the industry is yet to face the issues of copyright and subsidiary sales for you know, digital rights. For the last two days, we have been you know, here talking about sort of uh, printed books versus, versus digital books. So I just want to make a point here. Tamil traditional mode of writing was the palm leaves. We have had this mode for at least 3,000 years, you know, from what we can uh, find out, or more. The first book to be printed in any Indian language was probably in Tamil. It was done in Goa, in Roman script, for the purpose of uh, propagating, of, uh, propagating of Christianity, in 1550. It was done in 1550. And for several centuries after this, the palm leaf writing continued to flourish. We have evidence that in the early 20th century, books were that books that were you know, actually printed were then copied on to palm leaves. And that because you know printing and books are considered very cheap and you know, below the mark. So I won't I won't go into the reasons for this you know, in detail. But the point I want to make is that the future of printed book will not be decided on the basis of technology alone but also on the basis of culture and politics. We at College Children have made a few subsidiary sales for translations basically to Malayalam and English and to a few European languages. When I share news of sales with my authors, they are typically very moved. They are very excited about the possibility that work is being read by readers of other languages. When a publishing house takes the initiative to sell translation rights, it definitely strengthens its relationship with the author. In conclusion, issues like piracy, 2M, and digital rights, which are talking points for independent Indian publishers today, are not yet major issues for some publisher. But as the market develops, these changes are bound to hit us sometime in the future. On a more personal level, signing legal contracts, respecting copyrights, and doing our best to sell subsidy rights has had a very positive impact on our relationship with our authors. Two years back, I walked up to Mr. U. R. Ananda Murthy in a dinner in London. We had not met for a long time, so I began to introduce myself. So he silenced me, turned to his group, and then he introduced me. This is Kannan, my Tamil publisher, and he pays royalty. <laughs> for that very, very needed insight into the fact that Indian publishing is not just about English language publishing. My next speaker is uh, Mandira Sen, who doesn't need another introduction today because she was introduced yesterday. However, I've seen some new faces in the audience today, and for their benefit, I'd like to introduce Mandira Sen, who is the partner of Dr. Sen, founded in 1990, which publishes two imprints, three which for, uh, focuses on gender studies, and Samya, which focuses on culture, descent, and the writings of Dalits. She's based in Calcutta, and she will talk today about uh, some of the amendments that are in the bill uh, with regards to the business models of publishers and how they affect them.
very bases of the first two pillars are being hacked away, which presumably will also weaken the third royalty of one of royalty and income. And what's particularly interesting is that uh, nowhere does the act speak of authors and publishers together, but in a kind of adversary relationship. Publishers, it seems, and, and there is grounds for thinking that, as Dunnan has told us, have been full of malice, and authors have not gained their dues. Publishers have set high prices, and readers or students, or consumers, as the new jargon says, have been cheated. When foreign textbooks have been printed under license and meant to be low priced, these are not to be old books, and the new ones are high priced. There is no differentiation in the act between publishers. They're all lumped together. They are meaner at worst or unsympathetic to authors at best, and there's no reference to the intellectual pursuits of knowledge creation. Maybe you oh, we're not there yet, right? Sorry. So, but in reality, Indian publishing operates with small margins, regardless of the size of the publisher. I mean, maybe it's different from multinational, it should be. And it's it's the pattern that used to be followed in the West too, where you had small companies, very high quality companies like Alfred Locke, Victor Golands, and so on. But and uh, I think I quoted Andre Shrivastava yesterday to say that he said the profit of five percent or so per annum was normal. So it's not that vast sums are being made and these are kept from authors. The textbooks have a different trajectory. And these are what are being targeted by the government in the new act, especially the imported variety under license. But what we don't consider with homegrown textbooks is that there's a huge amount of editorial investment and, you know, as Pai Kumar would tell us, it's it. And the government has not bothered to differentiate amongst them. Now, in this scenario or reality, what is this clause to end on parallel imports going to do to publishing? The Act is not interested in contracts, as mentioned earlier. There's some details later in these, uh, uh, later, much later. In, in the investment in relationships that the publishers make with Act authors, they're not mentioning that at all. Publishers also create authors. And all clause to M says that when something called national exhaustion happens to a book, that must mean the first print run, this term is not used, then anyone abroad, and it's been explained by them very well, can come to an agreement with the author and copies. A new edition can be made and that can be imported. So the infringing copy has a specific definition. I'm not going to go over that because it's been defined. Uh, so, what does the publisher of the first print run do? I mean, do you just wait? Do you extend your print run so that it, there's no exhaustion? So it's all very complicated. It's not an easy thing to grasp. The thing is, the Act thinks it's being fair because it's not, you're not allowed to bring in copies from bookshops abroad. There has to be a printing. So there has to be an agreement. Now, but it does mean that the publisher of the first print run has to compete with these copies or take the decision not to reprint. What happens to all that editorial and production investment on the book? The new publisher gets free use of this, at least even if it's in a new cover, presumably the edited work is, the first edited work is used. Thus, for the Indian publisher, will the first print run become the only print run? Does it mean that to prevent national exhaustion, the print run is extended? What if the print book of the first print run had not originated in India, but been purchased in a rights sale abroad, i.e. printed under license? Its disappearance might not bode well for future rights sales from the other parts of the English-speaking publishing world. You as a publisher will not be seen as a reliable party, and your market will not be seen secure. And sadly, for no fault of yours, you are seen as risky as, say, the Russian publishing market. The problem for Indian publishers means that they are in a unique situation as the business model in the West. Let's go on to the next. Uh, the business uh, model in the West continues to exist as it always has. The territories there are protected, and an Indian publisher cannot 
send her or his second print run there with impunity. Some kind of agreement with the publisher or bookseller to export the book will be required. Because the foreign controls remain in place, but the Indian ones have disappeared. At the same time, the Indian publisher's ability to get foreign publishers to sell rights to them, as mentioned earlier, uh, have been jeopardized. Is the act nudging the Indian publisher to abandon print and go for e-books? But if the consumer and low price and accessibility are considered, then most consumers will still want physical copies. Because in India, the device you need to buy to download the e-book is not yet price friendly. Much that was the publisher's area of responsibility is handed over by the act to authors, who are generally quite unprepared to handle such tasks. Um, in my experience, when an author has handled a right sale, he or she has got much less for it. Most do not understand the implications. Never mind negotiating for rights. Most do not seem to know when they need to approach other publishers for copyright permission for material quoted lengthily in their manuscripts. Even the processing of these fees after negotiations on their behalf is often left to publishers. Now, Authors are euphoric or the ones who have been uh, interviewed in consultations on the bill. That globalization has made borders porous, but this has a double-edged effect. Piracy is much easier. Royalties do not necessarily grow. So if low prices are the new criterion of acceptability, then larger volumes of sale would be required to add to the royalties. And this heading is about authors. The act talks of authors at length. Is the overwhelming priority that is given to authors to explain their importance in the creation of knowledge? Publishers have always taken this very seriously. Indian publishing post-independence and pockets of it earlier has worked hard to contribute to cutting the hegemony of the Western publisher in the creation of knowledge. It is a matter of pride that much of sociology, anthropology, economics, history, philosophy, and the sciences from India have been published from India under Indian copyright. One thinks of D.T. Gosandi, G.S. Kurie, A.R. Desai, the Adikar School of History, and so forth. One thinks of the pioneering work of Asia Publishing House in the late 1950s, and in 1960s of a small publisher called Kitabistan, this, uh, maybe it must be before 1960 because he had published Nehru's Glimpses of World History. He was based in Alabama and then he did a lot of Nehru's books and so forth. And the entire genre of independent publishing in India and other large scale publishing too has generated much original knowledge. But the act does not support this endeavor. It does not realize that the absence of territoriality curtails this function and does not encourage to support it. What is basic is that nowhere does it acknowledge that publishing is risky and that publishers take very real risks in nurturing the creation of knowledge. It may take years of preparation. Some rough calculation does obeisance to overheads, but it is never anywhere near exact. The author is guided at every step, especially in the development or if substantive editing is needed and then distribution is still a cottage industry, based on sale or return, high discounts, credit periods, and so there's slow reimbursement of costs. These aspects of the business model have not been spoken of. Now, copyright societies. Copyright societies are given much provenance and are to be responsible to authors and not to owners, who I take, whom I take to be publishers. But what are these societies to do? Be like a watchdog? <coughs> In clause 7, section 19, item 10.1, it states that it seeks to amend this section 19 of the old act, as we mentioned earlier by other speakers, relating to the mode of assignment of copyright, the rights assigned, duration, territorial extent, specify royalty payable to the author or legal heirs, and the assignment is going to be subject to revision, extension, termination, whatever. Now, the amendment under section 10.2 tells us that uh, assignments spe shall specify other considerations besides royalty. Uh, and there's a lot of detail on these uh, copyright societies. 
uh, a lot of it may be directed at film producers and music companies and Authors Guild of India does support whatever is said under those sections. But, uh, it, you know, it is a little cons confusing. It's not at all clear what these copyright societies are going to do. Now, later in the running thereof of the societies, there's some uh, statement that some sections are not going to be made valid because they've worked out that the societies cannot be run by the authors who don't know how to run societies. And anyway, if the rights are not theirs, but with the owners or publishers, what are they going to manage? So if there's some confusion here. So there's a copyright board which will oversee copyright complaints, breaches, and court of appeal. So does that agreement then, does it get done with copyright societies or does it get done in the publisher's office? So in conclusion, a debate on copyright, its role, it, the way its purpose and usage is improved by amending a law is something vitally useful especially in a society where copyright, there's much confusion and often, as you've heard, authors don't know about copyright. But why has this 2011 Act, I think it was April 2011, right? Then yeah. come across as so one-sided. In many ways, it has tried to provide for new categories of rights of authors and lyricists and contributors to films and music and to institute rights and disabilities and so on, which are laudable. It is also appropriate to legislate for the digital age and against internet bias. But its view of publishing is harmfully one-sided, simply demanding low prices, and its belief that parallel imports will, will solve shortages or low prices is dangerously unfounded. It has not considered the consequences to the publishing industry, which isn't, as you heard from Vinuda, a massive, strong industry. And indeed, in fact, it's still quite a fledging industry. And indeed, it does not seem to have permitted wider consultations, despite its disclaimers. There has not been enough representation of all kinds of publishers. There should be concerted lobbying against the harmful clauses by publishers, which would lead to their weakening, if not disappearance. So that's quite strong. I'm very grateful to Dikinta for sending me material for this paper, and I've read Aparna Vishwanathan in the Hindu, I've read Nandika, Nandita Saikya, Aruna Sinha, Shambhal Bashir, and I think something like Pranesh as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we have kind of run out of time. This session actually should have, I now realize, been given much more time because there are many other things that I would have wanted to bring in, especially the 2M clause. And the claim in the Standing Committee report that the main purpose of this amendment was to allow for imports of copyright materials, example books, from other countries. Later on, somewhere else in the same uh, uh, discussion on 2M, the Standing Committee goes on to say, that the committee's attention was drawn to the fact that majority of educational books used in India were imported from other countries, particularly from US and EU. The low price editions were invariably the old editions than the latest ones. Now, I was speaking to Mr. Balani here, who is dealing with um, academic uh, books as well as textbooks, and he can also tell us that this claim is in fact incorrect and I don't know what evidence supports this because there's no evidence given to this and that brings me to my final point before we conclude and I'm sorry there's no time for discussion but please carry this discussion outside because all the people are here through the evening but uh, the fact that in India there are no industry statistics for publishing and that is urgently required. We need longitudinal studies that can tell us what are the real patterns in India because right now we kind of get swept by trends that are taking place in the US, Kindle, everybody's reading, but you know, you can't base your publishing decisions on what's happening in the US. You do need to do some of that. But our realities are very different. And territoriality in India, unlike in, the, in Australia or in other pan anglo countries, territoriality has been a cultural notion as much as it's a geographical notion. And for many publishers who have tried very hard to reduce the dependence on foreign books 
for Indian students. This comes as a complete, uh, you know, it's completely baffling why you would support this kind of dependence on foreign books. And with that, I'm going to conclude this session. Thank you all for being very patient with us. Um, and now we'll break for tea.